Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Winfield United Church and our virtual service for this Sunday, August the 23rd. No matter who you are, what you believe, no matter where you've been, you are welcome here. Whenever we gather at this place, we acknowledge we are standing in the traditional and unceded territory of the Sayoke Okanagan peoples. We are grateful for their stewardship of the land and its resources, for the people who have lived here and their teachings. If you have a candle with you, let us light our candles together. Lighting a candle is a reminder of Christ's example of love and hope, of light and warmth. Our world needs them all. Let's begin our time together this morning with a bit of centering and reflection and a word in prayer. Spirit God, as we gather this August morning, let us throw open the doors and windows to the cooling breeze to recognize that changes in the air is a part of life, savoring things as they once were looking to the future with anticipation and hope, finding peace and contentment in our time together here and now. Open our hearts and our minds that we might experience the divine presence in so many varied and unique ways, that we may share your love and compassion as we go into our week. Amen. Our opening gathering hymn this morning is from More Voices, number 12, Come Touch Our Hearts. From falling down the blazing fire Overturning justice, more gracious, come touch and bless our hearts. Our souls that we may know and love you. I'm going to invite Louise Miles to unmute her microphone and share with us in our reading for today. Louise. Good morning. While we live in a world in which it seems that most agency is given to people in obvious power, our reading for today from Exodus invites us to be aware that through compassion, courage, and cunning, character, characters otherwise considered secondary or insignificant, a future of hope is created for a whole people. How do 
courage, compassion, and cunningness that shape our own decisions and the chances we take to make our world a better place. The readers is from Exodus, um, chapter 1 to 8, um, verses 2 to 10 in the New International Version. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if a war breaks out, we'll join our enemies and fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them and force labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the move, they were oppressed. The more they multiplied and spread, so the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and work them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter and harsh with labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Pua, when you are helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. The midwives, however, feared God, and they did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do. They let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, Why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women. They are vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives, and the people increased and became even more numerous. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave his orders to all of his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but let every girl live. The birth of Moses. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Le 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 Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she got a papyrus, I think that's how you pronounce it, papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the banks of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the riverbank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this baby and nurse him for me, and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. And when the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses, saying, I drew him out of the water. May these words open us to Spirit's presence, and may wisdom come to us this day. I have a confession to make. I sometimes start sentences with the word and. If you don't read my written reflections following the service, you most likely don't even notice. But if you will read my typed script, I honestly, I feel you will if you read my typed script. 
I feel a pang of guilt every time I start a sentence with and. I have flashbacks to my elementary school days during language arts class where we were taught that a proper and grammatically correct sentence could not start with and. Maybe you remember that instruction as well. I do it all the time. I love starting a sentence with and because it connects my ideas and my previous sentence to what I'm about to say. And is becoming a popular word, but maybe not for the reasons you are thinking. It does, as a function as a conjunction, connect phrases and ideas. But it also speaks to societal phenomenon and it's becoming a way of reframing how we relate to one another and solve differences. The corporate world has been the first to embrace and thinking, and it is now showing up as a cultural and societal game changer. We are all familiar with the paradox that surrounds us. The glass is either half empty or half full. It's either or decision making. I'll give you an example. Say you went to your manager or your supervisor and made a request to work from home two days per week. The manager responds with, I understand your desire to do that, but I'll need to ensure coverage in the office. The use of but implies an immediate denial of the request. If the manager were to respond with, I understand your desire to do that, and I need to ensure coverage. It's an invitation to solve the problem together that's been created. The shift in one word acknowledges each person's interests as legitimate and recognizes that there are issues to be resolved and creates a positive environment for dialogue and moves away from paradoxical paradigms. Either or thinking comes from a competitive mindset which analyzes each option in isolation from the other. One wins, the other loses. One is right, therefore the other is wrong. We can't discount, discount this way of thinking because over the course of a day and a lifetime, many good decisions are made weighing out the benefits and risks. Where problems are more complex, however, this way of thinking polarizes attitudes, stalls thinking, and isolates parties who hold different views. And thinking, in contrast, comes from a mindset that is collaborative, that acknowledges the validity of other perspectives, and synthesizes individual views into a collective one. It leads to solutions that last. I remember being 22 years old sitting in my apartment in Regina one night. I was working a service job that I more than hated. I had just completed my BA that summer and was thinking about the next things in my life. I found a position posting with a public library in Weyburn, Saskatchewan, and it was my dream job at the time. But I came to a 22 years old decision that night but if I didn't get the library job, I was going to apply to nursing school. Well, you can likely guess how this little vignette ends. I got the library position, moved to Weyburn, and my future adult life unfolded as it was meant to. It included many moves along the way, as well as my vocation as a minister. Now, at midlife, I often find myself looking back on that either-or decision and realize how I am living life more into the end. Now I'm in a completely different stage of my living and decision making. I find myself striving to live with courage and with the and opportunities. Part of that is about being present and content with the choices I make. As a friend recently pointed out in describing her own actions and life choices, she is living into the end, where whatever happens to be on either side of it holds equal value. Today we hear the beginning of the Exodus story with the birth of Moses, an Egyptian ruler and a tyrant whose name we do not know, wishing to solidify his political power base 
identifies a group of people, the Israelites, as his enemy and threat. The Israelites came to Egypt during a time of famine and starvation because of the leadership of Joseph, who the story tells us was blessed by God. But now a new leader of Egypt has arrived who does not know Joseph and the history of the Israelite people. He's fearful of this group and unveils a genocide that calls for all Hebrew baby boys to be killed upon their birth. But it is the courageous action of women, two midwives, two women whom the Bible knows their names, Shipra and Pua. These two women, we are told, feared God and did not follow the Pharaoh's decree, and they let the boys live. And here enters Moses into our story. He is hidden by his mother, placed in a basket in the bulrushes, and found by Pharaoh's daughter. He has been born into a system that sees his people oppressed and enslaved, and he will grow to be a leader and a liberator. These two women, Shipra and Pua, are brave and courageous. They could have lived into the fear of Pharaoh's decree, the either-or thinking. They could have just said, we'll have to follow Pharaoh's decree. We're just women on the margins, and we can't stand up to such brutality. But because of their presence of faith, they chose not to participate in the genocide and put their own lives at risk because of their subversive actions. In our reading from Exodus, we hear that women feared God and did not follow Pharaoh's instructions. And this is our and moment for today. The women in this story all play a role in futuring the history of the Israelites. Sisters protect a newborn son. Midwives choose the sacredness of all human life without discrimination. An Egyptian princess raises a Hebrew baby boy, an adversary of her powerful father. The women did not succumb to self-minimizing thinking. They saw the and opportunities. They had courage, wit, and tenacity to outsmart the Egyptian king, to choose life over death, liberation over oppression. And is an odd theme for a Sunday message. But I encourage us this morning to think about our thinking and the things we tell ourselves, the things we tell others, those we are in relationship with, how we weigh the possibility possible against the impossible. May our faith align with our actions and our actions align with our faith. Amen and amen. I'm going to invite Louise to again unmute her microphone and share with us today's Minute for Mission reading.
unique teachers and unique students. Many of the Plains, Dakota and Nakota peoples have a sacred connection to the horse. For them, the horse holds immense cultural and spiritual significance and its energy is a pow powerful catalyst for change. If I could just insert something here, the next couple of lines are rather convoluted, so you'll have to bear with me. The spirit of the horse was certainly present among indigenous youth from Plains Presbytery in Saskatchewan conference during the Equinine Assisted Learning, EAL program at Cartier Farms in Spruce Home, Saskatchewan, a healing fund project that's also supported <clears throat> by mission and service. Ten young men participated in the week-long leadership program in July of 2018. The tools and strategies of the EAL facilitators and traditional knowledge keepers used this to help the young men grow into strong indigenous adults. By interacting with these incredible animals, the young men brought innovation, strength, and energy to everything they did on the farm. Despite the injustices that Indigenous youth face every day, the skills these young people took home helped them understand their place in the circle of life and equipped them with the inner resources to strengthen it. The EAL program acknowledges the need to support young people as they deal with the difficulties in life stemming from systemic racism and intergenerational trauma. For Indigenous youth, the trauma from colonial oppression continues to reverberate powerfully in their lives and circumstances. The impact from the Indian residential school system and other colonial practices is still felt today. The EAL program is a place for Indigenous youth to begin their healing. If mission and service giving is already a regular part of your life, thank you so much. If you have not given, please join me in making mission and service giving a regular part of your life of faith. Loving our neighbor is at the heart of our mission and service. Thank you. And as a community, we are grateful for all the donations we continue to receive despite um, the closure due to COVID of our building through PAR as well as mail-in offerings and e-transfers. And just by way of a reminder to um, those of you that are interested in supporting um, our mission and service partners to Lebanon, donations can be made to the United Church. They can either be made to Winfield or to the, to the United Church of Canada itself and earmarked for Lebanon relief. And I believe tomorrow is the last day for government matching funds to do that. So if you need more information, you can get in touch with myself or with May Husk. Right, so let us now prepare for our prayers of the people. And as we do so, let us pray with open hearts from the depths of our beings, sometimes with sighs too deep for words. We make this day the prayers of this gathered people, that our cares, our concerns, our joys and thanksgivings are heard and held up in the divine presence an embodiment experience here this morning in this gathering. So as we did last week, we're going to look at some of the areas that we direct our prayers and our thoughts and our concerns. And let's start with our prayers for this world. What are your, your concerns for things maybe you've heard in the news? And I'm just going to invite you to Unmute your microphone when you are ready. I'd like to offer prayers for the firefighters in the Okanagan uh, who are trying to put out the various fires. I'd invite us to consider, you know, the continued spread of COVID around the globe and um, the dire um, situation in Mexico as they've reached, I believe, 60,000 deaths. And I'd like to, you know, extend our prayers um, to all of those um, experiencing that, um, 
dire situation and particularly to hold up Griselda this morning, Adam's partner, who is a physician and along with her colleagues that, that are involved either on the front lines or certainly impacted by um, that, the pandemic in that nation, so. When we think of our community, um, closer to home, our families, our friends, ourselves, what are those um, concerns that you bring with you or, or celebrations and thanksgivings too? I guess I was a bit slow in working out what I might say as a prayer for the world is the climate change and that despite all of the upset of all communication, et cetera, by COVID, we still have to keep working at the climate change situations and lower our impact and that all countries will work with continuous effort to uh, make gains in our climate change control. Maybe the uh, onset of COVID will let people know that some of these things aren't myths for the future. They don't think climate change can happen, but nobody would believe that this uh, pandemic could come either. Maybe they'll take it seriously, you know. <clears throat> On that note, I pray that those who feel that the pandemic is a hoax will learn to understand that it is a serious issue that we need to deal with and will. Um, take heed with the warnings not to gather in large groups to keep distance. I want to go back to the um, also to the international scene and I I'm struck by the people who are are brave enough to stand up to oppression in countries like Belarus right now and in in in, uh, uh, in in Russia where where uh, political leader was presumably poisoned, those kinds of things. It, it's, I think it takes tremendous bravery to stand up in a situation like that. And, and, and I just want to extend prayers to these people who are brave enough to do that. I too would offer prayers this morning for those who are part of reopening our schools, for our kids, um, for teachers and professors and that are trying to navigate a constant state of flux. And this is the decisions that families are needing to make over whether or not to send their children back to school. Um, yes, it's a weighty decision, I think, that's not entered lightly and um, probably has lots of ramifications one way or the other for the future of education. I'd like to offer prayers for our leaders and politicians of all stripes across our country to sit back, take a breath, think twice and get back to some kind of cohesion and to just remember that it's about the people. I would just like to follow up on uh, Sharon's um, thanks to the firefighters. Our son is in evacuation alert in Penticton and he said um, they were so proud when they saw the fire trucks and firemen going by to line up 
along um, a part of the uh, evacuation alert. And he said, there were no two trucks in a row from the same location. They were from all over BC. And he was so proud to be Canadian and the thanks that they offered. I would like to, um, I would like for us to keep in mind um, those seniors that have been in uh, quotation mark lockdown uh, without being able to interact with their families and the, uh, the mental anguish that, uh, that the um, residents are feeling and also the families of, of those that are um, trying to advocate for their loved ones to have more access in their in their waning years. Um, yeah. We also send out healing prayers to those that we name in our own community here at Winfield United for Dawn and Bev, for Lynn and Dawn. For Gary. For Greg. For Shirley, for Jim and Sharon, Catherine and Stephen, for Sandy Hebert, for Linda and her children. and those we name in the silence of this space. And as we continue into silence and reflection May we pray the words that have the most meaning for us or simply contemplate on all that has been shared. Amen. For, I guess we're going to have our closing hymn for this morning. I'm going to invite Jim to maybe come over closer to my laptop. And we're going to sing together. One more step along the world I go from Voices United number 639. step along the world I go. One more step along the world I go. From the old things to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling
traveling along with you. From the corner of the world I turn, more and more about the world I learn. All the new things that I see, you'll be looking at along with me. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. Give me courage when the world is rough. Keep me loving though the world is tough. Leap and sing in all I do. Keep me traveling along with you. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. You are older than the world can be. You are younger than the life in me. Ever old and ever new. Keep me traveling along with you. And it's from the old I travel to the new. Keep me traveling along with you. Before we leave for coffee time this morning and our and have our blessing, I just want to make a little bit of announcement. Um, as August kind of slowly or quickly begins to draw to a close. I know lots of you are probably wondering what um, what the fall is going to bring for uh, access to the building. So I just want to, I don't have lots of details to share, but I think you heard Jim mention that um, we've been doing some technical testing in the sanctuary to see what um, having a small group in the building looks like while we um, continue to do a Zoom type service for those of you that are um, making that work for you and feel most comfortable uh, staying at home. So uh, council meets um, on the 8th of September and I expect that there will be um, a decision made about going forward um, to share with you all after that meeting. So thank you all for your patience and um, your understanding. Um, I think going forward, we're going to take small steps because this is a totally new thing and it's going to mean lots of changes for all of us, not just um, those of us in leadership, but for those that will um, uh, be participating in services in the building. So lots of details will be shared once they are made more official and are ready. So I just wanted to let you all know that and to let you know that we are coming back to the building. That is something that we hang on to. We might not know when, but we will gather again. It'll be steps along the way, along the world we go. So blessings on your week and let us now join together in our commissioning and sending forth. As we leave this place, may we count our blessings. Live in a authentic life. Never look down. Struggle for life. No, there's no There's a soul. And no, wherever we go, the spirit of God is there. Amen.